Today I am with Rolf Baker, aka Deadly Ernest. Deadly Ernest. Deadly Ernest. So thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining me today. Now, for those of you that don't know, Mr. Deadly Ernest, aka Rolf Baker, uh, is also my stepfather. So I want to take the opportunity because apparently um, all the pretty much most of the footage from when you had a character back on TV has been destroyed. Is that correct? All destroyed except for about two minutes, which you can find on Google. Oh, wow. Got to love Google. So we <laughs> thought, I thought, well, if we've got an opportunity, I'm going to ask you some questions because, you know, I'd like to know a little bit more about your life and what happened and how this character came to be. So firstly, how did Deadly Ernest come about? Deadly began because channel, the Channel O network, as it then was, we know it as Channel 10 today, uh, the Channel O network had um, a film package. Yep. And part of this film package was um, a bundle of shocking B-grade horror movies. Like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes oh, or something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Mothra was another with this dreadful... Japanese moth going flip flop flip flop. <laughs> um, they were shocking things. And they didn't know what to do with them. What on earth can we do with this? Never going to get any viewers. So um, somebody um, in Sydney came up with the idea of having a horror host to host these movies. So they began, I've got an idea they actually began in Brisbane. Uh, somebody played Deadly Ernest up there. Yeah. And then in, in Sydney, yeah. where it was done by Shane Porteous, a name which may ring bells with some. Um, so that was two Deadlies on the go. And then I was asked to have a look at the videotape mm -hmm. of the uh, Shane Porteous Deadly. And they said, do you think we can do something? And I said, oh, I'm sure we Specifically can. Specifically for Melbourne we're yep. talking about? Yep. yep. I said, oh, I'm, I'm sure we can. Uh, so um, a couple of us sort of put our heads together and uh, I finished up writing a, a script for it and uh, we did a, a pilot. Yeah. And they said, yeah, that should be okay. Uh, so we'll record them um, on Fridays. We recorded two weeks at a time. So we recorded the first one and played it and we said, well, we hope that's all right. And um, letters started coming in. Good ones or bad ones? Good ones. <laughs> Good ones. And um, as we went on over a few weeks, the letters got more and more. So obviously we'd hit a little niche. Um, as to what we did, we just made it up as we went. Um, as I said, I wrote a script for the first one. But by the time we started getting the letters, I didn't need a script. I just made it up using the letters and we added different things in um, we had um, in the set there was a coffin uh, which I emerged and that was just a prop that was lying around the, uh, the station so we used that not a common prop is it no, no, no. <laughs> um, then we had a, a, a grilled sort of cage uh, top which opened, you could open up, um, and we said that there was a bird in there, and uh, we'd feed him, the, we'd read the letters, and then feed Igor, our pet bird, feed him these letters, and there'd be a chomp, 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 and then the most disgusting burp you've ever heard which was recorded by one of the young sound engineers and that's the, the burp from the burp <laughs> yeah. and he, um, we we gave him a, a bottle of soft drink probably coca-cola i think and he drank down the bottle <laughs> and then turned on the microphone and said go for it and he did <laughs> <laughs> so um, igor would eat his letters um when we started looking for a costume we said, oh, an old funeral director's outfit, frock coat, frilled shirt. And I said, oh, well, I need gloves. I don't want, these hands look too smooth for a horror character. So we put gloves on. They were like gloves from a, you know, a wedding outfit. Yeah. I put 
the right hand glove on's good, that's good. I put this one, I said, oh, hang on, we've got two right hand gloves, but, oh, that's all right, we'll keep it. <laughs> because you put a right hand glove on the left hand, yeah. and the hand is immediately distorted. So we kept that, and that became claw. Claw was um, very well liked. What did Claw do that made him well liked? But what, what did Claw do that made him claw, well liked? Uh, oh, all sorts of things, including choking me. Oh, as you do. And, and, and <laughs> I'd say something Claw didn't like particularly, and he just, uh, and I'd have to fight him off. <laughs> um, until one day it got too much, so I got a chopper and chopped him off. Oh my goodness! <laughs> just he chopped off your own head. <laughs> I did. What he went. Um, we had, oh, because I had the um, two right hands, I also um, did it with the foot, so I wore two right boots. They, oh. weren't, they weren't a matched pair, but I'd have a, just an ordinary boot on the right foot, and on the other one was a big old sort of riding boot type thing. So I sort of limped on that side and had claw on that side. Um, as for the script, as I said, we just made it up as we went, and, wow. and depending on what letters I'd received. Some people wrote poetry about it. Bad poetry. <laughs> but, but good but poetry. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but good, at least it was something that rhymed and I could read it out. Yeah. I could be nasty about it, and um, which was my main thing. And then, of course, there was always, at the end, the, uh, uh, the, the signature call which was, um, and this is going to be an awful movie, and when I say awful, I'm deadly earnest. <laughs> it's the eyeball that gets me every yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. I had scars on the face. Yeah, you had like a big gash of yeah, blood big gash coming of down. One, uh, yeah, and uh, one, one eye was up and one eyelid was up, one was down. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty revolting looking character. So, okay, so who came up with the name Deadly Ernest? Was that already by the time it got to you? By the it time it got done? to me, it was, yes, it's a, that was what the segment was called okay. on all the, uh, all the different channels. channels. After I'd done, uh, after I'd commenced uh, the, the Melbourne one, uh, somebody else began in uh, Adelaide. Yeah. And I think he also did the uh, Perth one. Right, okay. Um, I can't ask him because he's no he's longer passed. with us. Yeah. yeah. So that's it, interesting because, you know, like I think it's something that we don't realise that today with TV it's national, whereas yes. it was very much state by state back like, then. You didn't have the, uh, the, the cable as is what we used to have between the different states. The coaxial cable. Yes, we definitely mm. things have changed. Yeah. So... You know, for you, what was your role before you became Deadly Earnest? Oh, at that time, I was a floor manager. For, it was Channel O, wasn't yeah, it, back then? Yeah. Okay, which is now Channel 10. Yeah, so I did uh, shows uh, like um, uh, Young Talent Time, uh, a show I can't even remember the name of, um, uh, with a, a, a famous British singer who fronted the show. And that was a talent show that we did for... Crawford Productions. Okay. And we had a lot of um, a lot of fun doing some of those. I worked on a lot of the um, musical shows. Um, one that ran for three hours on a Saturday morning. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that was um, uh, probably famous because that's where. Um, the Molly Meld. That's where Molly Meldon began. A uh -huh. countdown. Oh, uh, no, this no. was pre-countdown. Yeah, the pre, pre countdown Was he wearing yeah. a hat back then? No. This is before, before the hat. When he, hat. And he had hair, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, this was before. <laughs> no hat. one's ever sure whether that yeah. was his hair or not under that hat. <laughs> and I even had to stand in for Molly one day. Oh. Because Molly was there um, basically to do commercials for a, um, a, a paper called Go Set. Okay. Um, the Go Show was another show that uh, that we did that I was the uh, floor manager for. Um, and one day they called for Molly, said, get Molly in, set him up, commercial's coming up. And we looked around and we said, where's Molly, where's Molly? And somebody said, he's in the canteen. 
So they said, hop in there, Ralph, you do it. <laughs> the temporary uh, Molly Mel drive. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't have a clue what was in the paper or anything else, so I talked absolute rubbish for about 60 minutes. Uh, 60 seconds, I think. 60 seconds. The God was only 60 seconds or 60 yeah, minutes. No, 60, 60 <laughs> seconds or two. And, um, and, and so that got over that, uh, that commercial break that Molly was supposed to do. And then, of course, he went on to other shows. We had Ian Turpy doing, uh, uh, that was the Go Show, I think. Um, and, and later, uh, Johnny Young, of course. Oh, yes. Did, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Did uh, the Go Show. Um, so how many years were you at Channel O for doing the floor managing? Uh, well, well, there in total. Well, I, I started in the prop crew, mm-hmm. props and staging. I worked through that and became a floor manager. Yeah. Uh, I did that for a few years and then um, I was a, a producer for some uh, mornings. I did a, similar to the morning breakfast shows now, and a little later uh, in the morning. Yeah. Um, we did that with Roy Hampson uh, as, the, as the host. Uh, so I was probably there about 10 years or so, I think. Is this the sixties that, that we're talking about here? Mm, good lord! Yes. Yeah, the late, right. the late, the <laughs> late, the late sixties, early seventies. I did deadly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, it was one hell of a character. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I, I I know I've I've witnessed some of the changing character from the man that is sitting here right now <laughs> to when you would you know get into your costume. So explain to us. You know, some of the things you did and how you felt once you got, in, you know, you're sitting in the, the makeup chair and then your makeup is all done. What would happen? It was a, a, a strange thing because you didn't, and you probably heard many an actor say things like this, but you really did feel a change come on. Mm. Makeup took about an hour. Yeah. So and by hard. the time it was done, you felt differently. Yep. And as um, my wife, who I hadn't met at this uh, stage, I was married, but to somebody else at the time, um, but my now wife um, had, had never witnessed it, of course. No. <laughs> because it was all before we got together. And she and didn't watch the show no, back in no, those days. No, she wasn't allowed to watch the show. Mm, like many, many people many, weren't allowed many, to. <laughs> many of them snuck in mm, to watch and, it. <laughs> uh, so she couldn't quite understand because by the time the makeup was on, I was not Ralph anymore. I was something different. Mm. And uh, it was, oh, uh, who is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to change up your, yeah, your, your yeah. Uh, relationship for a bit. <laughs> so we had an interesting audience. Yeah. The letters came in from kids. Yeah. Uh, a lot of kids would go to bed at their normal time on a Friday night. Yes. They would set their alarm for 10.30 and they would wake up, watch the opening hosting there were actually two more after that, a mid-hosting and a closing one. But they'd watch the opening hosting and then go back to bed. Mm, <laughs> then okay. you had people like uh, university undergraduates or that sort of age group uh, followed it. Um, I, I still get, um, amazing, or it, to me it's amazing, uh, today um, I'll be somewhere where there's an older person and somebody will say something about Deadly. And I say, oh, I remember dead. So, well, you know, that was me. Oh, <laughs> yes. you used to love watching you. Yes. And, and, you know, we're talking about 50 years or so ago. You know, mm. I've got incredible. friends myself where mm. they were just like, oh, my God, that's just our father. And even when um, I, I remember when I, you know, I was getting engaged and we're having an engagement party and we're bringing all the families together and... I was like, I'm putting the two fathers together, you know, what's going to happen? And even uh, my uncle, and they literally knew who Ralph was, and it was just like, oh, and, I, and I was standing there, and my mum was standing there, and we're going, what the hell is going on? And they knew because they were the kids. So they would have been probably, what, 10 at the time, and they were the ones that were the kids sneaking 
up yeah, at yeah. night but we're to watch to it. it. They yeah. weren't supposed to watch it and they just wanted to see Deadly. That's, that's right. It's yeah. really fascinating how <laughs> one character can have such impact. So from what I know, you um, you also are at a couple of wax museums. Um, yeah, the first one uh, was down in St Kilda. So killed a, there was a wax museum there? Yeah, there was a wax museum okay. um, for a short time. And then um, it moved to up, up to the country. Um, oh, which town was it? Is it a Chuka? Yes, I think it was a Chuka. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember going up there and there is actually a wax museum up there. Yeah, well, yeah. No, I don't know if it's still there today. Um, I, well, no, I don't think it would be. Um, but yes, I got in touch with me and uh, they put a wax figure of Deadly in there. Um, and that figure later went to Queensland and I think it's in a wax museum. Is that the, the Ripley's Coast. one? R Ripley's Believe It or Not or something like that Is on that the Gold really Coast? It? Yes. So yes. that would be there today. It so if you're on there. the Gold Coast, you're yeah. in Cavill Avenue which is the main area, that's where you will, can go in and find yourself the wax of Deadly Ernest yeah, yeah, and have yes. a selfie together. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I um, love it, yes. Uh, of course, I had, um, uh, I, I had my own young son as well uh, at that time. Um, and I remember um, he had a birthday party and at that same day he had his party, I had a personal appearance as Deadly. Oh, okay. So I came back to the party. In Deadly outfit? In the full Deadly outfit. <laughs> and scared the hell out of one of the children. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, had your son seen you like that? <laughs> yes, he had. He had? Yeah. He was <clears throat> somewhat puzzled by it because he'd been with me down in the studio. He'd seen all the makeup done. He'd seen me turn into Deadly Ernest. Um... And then on Friday night, he could sit at home and see me on the screen as Deadly Ernest. So it was a bit confusing. Fathoming out how can you be here and, and you're in there. The box. And, uh, <laughs> so you did quite a few, um, I suppose, uh, I was going to say performances, but you were going to certain areas and, you know, like you were turning up as Deadly Ernest. As deadly. Personal so, appearances, yeah. But that's what I was meaning, personal mm -hmm. appearances. So, um, Tell me, what's the, like, out of personality, as you said, once you've got the outfit mm. on, you would do things that you wouldn't normally oh. do? In, so give us an idea of something that was, like, completely left-wing that you would never do that you yep. did in that character. The, the, the first personal appearance I did was at the Dendy Theatre in Brighton. Yeah. Uh, then I did one at um, Forest Hills, and that was to introduce a horror movie, mm -hmm. which I did from the stage. When I did, when I did the Dendy one, again, uh, I'd never done any such a thing, so I didn't know what to expect. Again, I'd written a script for it. I got out on the stage and started, said hello to everybody, and they called things out and they answered. The script just went out the window. There was <laughs> no need for it. Yeah. Uh, so this Forest Hills one, and I started and we was doing that same thing. And somebody approached the platform and I was sitting on the edge of the platform at the time. And he put a hessian bag down beside me and just walked away. Well, the, the Ralph Baker inside Deadly is going, uh-oh. <laughs> I wonder what could be mm. in the hessian bag. <laughs> Deadly's going, oh, there's a bag, we better open this up. So I just opened the bag stuck my hand in it and pulled out a snake. <laughs> I would have had a heart now, attack. As, as Ralph, I would never have done that. <laughs> Not in, no, so no. we have a snake turned up here, don't be calling Ralph. Deadly, you very quietly just you know, handled the snake and then put it back in the bag and pushed it away. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I got other things, other appearances. I did one for him. And a, a universe, some university, it was a ball, I think, um, at, at which uh, I was able to take my wife, whom uh, we dressed up as um, Elvira. 
Ooh, who later actually did pretty much the same character in the modern times, or yeah, legal yeah, modern yeah, times. Yeah. Um, Elvira also would introduce yeah. really bad movies. That's so isn't right. that interesting? Yeah. 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 And the female so, morph of Deadly Ernest. I know, um, I got a, um, and I, I was given a rat of one of those, I remember. Mm. Somebody came and met, it was a dinner and everything. And then, plate with a rat on it. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. So you never knew what to expect. <laughs> I also remember another one. Oh, and I can't remember. It was a drive-in movie. I can't remember just where. Um, and I um, did a bit inside uh, where the, um, uh, the counter is for all the food and so on. Uh, and I did a bit banter backwards and forwards between the audience and then somebody yelled out from right in the back corner something to Deadly. I don't even know what it was said but it was a rather rude remark. And I just jumped straight off the little podium I was on. I just jumped off and headed straight for that back corner. And the people who worked at the uh, Driving came running in to protect me and to call the other guy. Away. <laughs> deadly was going to take him out. It was getting deadly. <laughs> so uh, you said you had a coffin. Yes. Did you ever go in the coffin? I did. I went to one uh, personal appearance, uh, which wasn't terribly far from Channel O, uh, because it was the match. It was a football match between the cast of Hair, which yep. was playing at the time, and Channel O. They were playing football. They were playing football. Okay. It was a charity match. And uh, so Deadly was booked to go along and uh, cheer the team along. So uh, they booked an old hearse. It was about a 1928 hearse. Yeah. And the hearse rocked up. We said, all right, we just put the coffin in the back and we'll stop just before we get to the place and you can get in it. So they put it in and then discovered that you couldn't open the lid because the oh. roof was too low. Oh, no, I, said, I can oh, see where this is what going. What are we going to do? I said, well, I'll hop in the coffin now and then put the coffin in. So I hopped in the coffin and I put the coffin in and drove to this football ground. So I've already had my drive in the coffin. <laughs> you preempted it many years in yep. advance. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's yep. nothing. <laughs> I mean, we see those movies where you, you're locked in the coffin yeah, and, right. and it's like, yeah. let yeah. me out. And you yeah. literally had I've, to go through that experience. I've been <laughs> so, did you find that your character would merge with your personal life at all, or could you keep it quite separate? Uh, quite separate, really. Um, Except if you're having a joke or something like that, you could you just throw on the eye and <laughs> lift, lift the eyebrow and that sort of thing. Um, but no, they were quite they were quite separate. But once I was in makeup and the costume, I wasn't me. I was deadly. Okay. Me. Do you, do you, when you think back on it, is it fond memories for you? Oh yeah, yeah, it was a fun time. It's fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Way well, better than just yeah, being a yeah. you know floor manager yeah. or a producer. Oh, yeah, yeah, or... yeah, yeah, yes, it was fun. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't something that was well paid. I think I got twelve dollars a week. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, those of you complaining about what you're getting paid. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so was there like a gradual, you know? sort of the slow death of Deadly yeah. or what happened there? Well it reached, it reached one point where I thought uh, I, I really have had enough of doing this and uh, it's not really bringing me much in the way of reward. Uh, not for 12 not, bucks. Not <laughs> anyway. yeah. um, So I said I wouldn't do it and they set the studio up one, one Friday and I didn't appear. And uh, a couple of hours later, somebody caught me and said, Ralph, you, you, you haven't done your recording. I said, I'm not doing it anymore. I told you that. Oh, you have to do it. So we finished up with a bit of an argument. They persuaded me to do it, which I did. So that was two weeks went down on tape. And then discussion with the um, uh, program manager. They gave me a raise. Oh, is that how it works? <laughs> $12 to 20 That's actually quite a big jump when mm. you think about it for back then. $12 to 20 But in that intervening week before I 
changed to the 20. Um, I'd, uh, I'd introduced one of the shows um, and I had the uh, TV Times. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the TV Times and said, what, what's on tonight? What are we playing against it? Oh, the cricket's on Channel 2. What are you watching us for? You should be watching Channel 2. <laughs> oh, that didn't go down well. So <laughs> the next uh, the next Thursday I went to collect my pay and there was a note in the pay envelope <laughs> saying we don't advertise other channels programs. That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> and there was no money in there. <gasps> because just of note, that? Just no, no money. Oh, wow. But it was all right. It was just a joke on their part. <laughs> <laughs> Having a go back at me. <laughs> and hence, that was <laughs> it. <laughs> the interesting thing uh, about that was that Keith Bailhash was the man who handled the uh, payments. And he was the first man who hired me for um, a, a job in television. And he was at that time the secretary at Channel 9. Ooh, and my first, uh, my first four or five years of television was at, uh, was at Channel 9. Right. Where I began as... Uh, uh, so you'd already moved from station to station yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'd, uh, I started there as the office boy. Yeah. And then I went through onto the staging crew where I worked on in Melbourne tonight and, and Jimmy Hannon's shows and all sorts of uh, uh, shows. Anything that came out of Channel 9 I was working on. Mainly yeah. night shifts. Okay. So you'd start at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and finish at one o'clock in the morning, or whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah, sleep right till hours. midday. <laughs> You're a little vampire yeah, back then. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you work on um, other shows and are there other famous people that maybe, you know, some names that people would know that you've worked with uh, other than just the deadly character? Yeah, there's names that I'd know, can I think? Of course, I've worked with uh, a really big name, mm. Fred Bear. Fred, Fred Bear? Fred Bear. <laughs> uh, um, and um, what was his... Was that Grant Kennedy? That? Wasn't Fifi. that on then? Uh, no, that was... Um, Fred... Was it Fred at Channel O? It was Fred and Fifi Bear. Fred and Fifi Bear. Yeah, and I actually stood in for Fifi on one occasion. Fifi's a female, right? Yeah. Okay. But it was played by John Michaelhausen. Okay. It's a fairly well-known name. Still writes uh, television reviews and so on. Um, he couldn't be at a, a recording for some reason or other, so they asked me to stand in. Mm -hmm. Now, your face was completely covered by a bear mask, so okay. nobody could tell who was there. The only person who woke up was um, a, a news, news reader and announcer, Colin, Colin something, I know he's no longer with us either. Um, and he looked at me and he said, you're not John. And I didn't answer. Even that. inside the, yeah, wow. Inside the whole costume. Okay. And somebody said, well, how do you know he's not John? And he said, because his legs aren't thick enough. <laughs> and you do have small legs. No, I, I didn't fill out the costume enough to, uh, to fool the uh, to fool Cole. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, there were big names I worked with, but I can't remember them all now. Oh, that's okay. Um, getting too old, and they skip my memory. <laughs> Not a problem. So you went from working in TV. Yeah. Eventually, you'd had enough of that. I'm assuming. Well, um, I was retrenched, really. Okay. Um, after um, uh, I'd worked on uh, a show uh, there as a, uh, as a producer, mm -hmm. um, the show finished and there was really nothing for me to do. So they let me go, uh, which was a bit of a problem, as I had, as I said before, a, a young son. And by that time, 
I had a daughter, only just very recently born. She'd been born in December, and this happened early in the next year. Wow. So I didn't know what to do. Um, I tried a couple of other stations, but they didn't need anybody at the time. So I finished up buying a cleaning business. And I ran a cleaning business totally different. for four years. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, at the, that was um, um, at the end of that time. Um, I needed something else to do. I had enough of the cleaning. Um, and I answered an ad in the local paper mm -hmm. which was wanting somebody for a puppet theatre. Okay. No, I didn't know anything about this puppet theatre. Um, I thought, well, well, I suppose there's no harm in giving it a go, seeing what it's like. Acting's acting. Yeah. So uh, I went along uh, for an interview. Uh, the theatre had been running about 10 years or something. Um, she was originally an American lady who had married an Australian and moved out here. Mm -hmm. um, I did the interview and an audition. And, and then she said, I don't just want to hire somebody just on that. I want you to come and see a show and see what happens in the show itself. Good so I did. I went and watched the show. There was herself and a young man. And um, I was very impressed by it, by the way they worked. It was in a kindergarten and the way they worked with the children in the kindergarten. I thought, this is good. And so she said after that, if you're still open to it, I'll be happy to give you a trial. So I okay. started with her. Mm -hmm. She'd had a, a, a string of people, some who stayed with her for a year, somebody else may have stayed for two years, somebody only stayed for six months, which meant she was continually training somebody new all the time. It's exhausting. Yeah. And um, so I started with her and... Um, 30 years later, she passed away. <laughs> 30 years is a long time. Wow. Uh, we worked together all that time. Um, wow. In, uh, in really sort of very um, uh, close circumstances, you were behind a puppet theatre, which was about six foot long, and there was just the two of you in behind there, plus your, your puppets, and you had to have your puppets on stage and work around each other. Um, which we learnt to do in rehearsals, how it was the best way to move and where one would circle around the other, etc. Um, and yeah, I just stayed on and on and we'd write a new show and um, bring that to life. And it, it was a very enjoyable time. It was a lovely way to make a living. Yeah. It wasn't a big living, uh, but it was enough. We got by uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed those days. After uh, Laurie had passed on, um, I continued uh, with a, a solo theatre show, all on my own, with a show called The Three Little Pigs with a Twist. And um, I went for a, no, roughly another six years, I think, uh, on my own before I found it was becoming too much physically and I couldn't do it anymore. Because holding your hands up for yep. that period of time yep. is quite difficult. It was hard. I had mm. to hold my hands in front of a curtain. There'd be a curtain there. My hands had to be that side, and I was back behind the curtain. And, oh, we used to find... In, in Laurie's Theatre, it was a higher theatre, and you did have your arms pretty well straight. Mm. Uh, but we would find... We'd have our Christmas break. Yeah. And you'd come back after Christmas and start rehearsing a new show for the year. And you'd get ten minutes into it and say... Oh, can we have a rest? I can't hold my arms up any longer. Yeah. And it took a month of rehearsal to get, get back into back in. uh, um, uh, fitness again. To, uh, to people do don't it. think about that, do they? No. You know, um, no. you know that you do yeah. need to have that fitness because you've got to yeah. have the arms up. And you you had to be match fit. <laughs> yeah, very match fit. So really, that's like thirty six years as a puppeteer. Yeah. yeah. And you, uh, one of the things I know, I definitely have seen the three little pigs because it became a family tradition. What was it? The third birthday. The third birthday, all the grandchildren had a 
show for their birthday. And I know I'd always be sitting there and I'd end up talking mm-hmm. to the uh, the pigs and the wolf. <laughs> and I'm like, hang on, I've got really involved in this show. You, you get sucked in so easy, guys. Um, but, you know, what I liked with what you and Laurie were doing is you did some really great educational shows yeah. where you were talking. I remember going to one that was, um, it was like the forest. And you had, you had, it was showing like that you've got the, the, the really tall trees in the forest, you've got the lower ones, mm. and you're sort of educating, or oh, might have been the Amazon or something like that, and then you had the bilby. The bilby the was bilby, a huge yeah, one. Yeah. You know, like, I still most have, people don't even know what the bilby is, you know. I still have um, a bilby from another educational show, uh, which was a safety show, which we did for Vic Rhodes. Okay. Um, we were asked to put a show together uh, to take and to tour around kindergartens. So we put a show together, we weren't too keen on it, we didn't like it very much and said, I don't think it's going to grab anybody and we finished up saying, no, we're not going to do it. Yes. And Vic Rhodes came back to us again and said, please. So we set about and rewrote the whole thing again and uh, Vic Rhodes backed us and we toured it for a couple of years or so and in that we had a bilby who stood about... Oh, two feet tall, I suppose. Wow. Who's a big fellow. Uh, his mouth opened and his eyes moved, his ears waggled. Wow. Um, and I've still got him. You still got you yeah. haven't parted with him because I know no, we've parted with a lot of the yeah, puppets yeah. and you know, and pass the love on for other children to yeah. learn how to use them. Still got Bill Bilby. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so I actually have got oh, and I thought I'd just bring it in here. I've got a puppet. Uh, that actually I was bought for uh, my birthday. <laughs> so I thought while well, I've got you here, I might get you to show us, especially because, you know, this is something you did for 36 years yes. and you know, lots of kids are getting into puppets again. So I thought maybe you could just give us some quick tips on how to use a hand puppet. Right. So there is it a make anyway. I know you made a lot of yours, didn't you? We did. We made most of our own. Not something like Bill Bilby, which was a, a, a big specialist uh, puppet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most of the others we made ourselves, um, using a lot of um, uh, uh, material, but perhaps fur, uh, um, all sorts of stuff, so you could do things like that. Baby <laughs> nose, yeah. And uh, one of the one of the secrets. Of bringing a puppet to life is one of course keeping it moving so that it looks like um, it has blood flowing through it but one of the secrets I suppose I can tell a secret uh, <laughs> is the way you make them talk now you don't need to be a ventriloquist a ventriloquist okay. of course is stand uh, uh, and make the puppet talk away without moving his lips well I can't do that or only a little bit, um, you've got to make, draw all the attention to the puppet. So the puppet's got to stay alive, even when he's not talking. He's got to react to what's being said. And then when he does talk, it's not just a matter of opening the mouth like that, which is pretty dead and doesn't do much. You've got to be able to bring him to life and really let him talk. Show his personality. Yeah. And this one would be a rather nasty puppet. <laughs> well, I think it was bought to, uh, for when I want to have a rant on Facebook Live. Yeah. This will be the new personality. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it. Keep that puppet moving so that there's always breath in the puppet. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> Did you enjoy coming um, up with new characters, like yes, the sound? Yes, yeah. and one of the most important things is finding the puppet's voice. Okay, now how do we do that? By experimenting. Okay. Um, we did one show, we'd rehearsed it for a couple of weeks, and a particular character, one of the lead characters in the play, um, I just couldn't find his voice. And it's so hard to bring life to it if, if you can't find the essence of the, of, of the, the puppet. Okay. So eventually I suddenly 
cracked it. I tried the voices. That's it. That works. And suddenly the whole puppet became alive okay. and he belonged and he fitted in. So you're going to have to do the same. I'm going to have to come, yeah, I'm going to have to come up with its own voice. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had all these puppets there. It was at a market and I kept playing with this one because I yeah. just thought he was funny looking. <laughs> He's evil. Yeah. <laughs> the alter, and I think it's a beauty with puppets and with the character you did, Italy Ernest, that you were able to really morph into these different characters and explore your own personality. Yeah, oh, you, you do really, yes, yeah. Because mm. you don't know what you're capable of always until you, you try it and, it and it works, you know. Yeah, I love it. The other thing with uh, working with children and this was basically we, we worked in kindergartens and primary schools but they were different shows the kindergarten show was written for that level uh, and you'd get wonderful reactions sometimes and you knew you were you were getting just what you wanted to get and I can think of one in particular where a boy and girl meet on the beach mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know each other. Um, one is brought down to the beach, the girl is brought down to the beach by her father. Uh, the boy is brought down to the beach by his mother. And the two children get together and they're talking. And the girl finally says to the boy, Oh, and uh, where's your daddy? And the little boy says, Oh, well, my daddy doesn't live with us anymore. He's, he's moved to Queensland. And she said, oh, and a little voice came from the audience and said, it's all right, he still loves you. Oh, oh, oh. And, isn't uh, it gorgeous? Uh, yeah, it almost made it hard to go on with the next bit of the show. Uh, but you knew you'd hit the mark. This was what you were getting at, you know. Um, and it's moments like that that really made things. And of course, there were other moments that really set you off into hysterics, and you couldn't laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Could you get your characters to laugh? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, Red, um, there was a naughty possum in one show, and this naughty possum walks off stage where there's a bird's nest. The possum walks off stage and disappears for a moment. Then the possum comes back walks over by the uh, bird's nest and he's looking into the nest and the children start getting very restless and one little voice said go away possum <laughs> and then another voice would come in go away possum and it, it would build until they were all calling out go away possum and this one little voice came over right over the top of the wall and said piss off possum <laughs> And of course, it's very hard not to laugh. Keep a straight face. <laughs> and the kindergarten directress was mortified. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all part of the show. Yeah. Uh, I so love it. So we had, we had laughs and uh, moving moments, um, all part of which made it such a, a great way, as I said, to, to earn a living. Okay, so is there a message that you would tell someone out there that they, you know, like, they don't have, they don't know what they want to do with their life. They don't have, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure today to supposedly know what you want to do and, you know, you're supposed to know what career and what purpose yeah. and passion and all that other stuff. <clears throat> you know, you've done 36 years as a puppeteer. You did yeah. quite a few years before that working in and around television. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you had a cleaning business for the four years. Yeah. So, you know, you've done quite a few things. Is there something that you would say to someone that's just not sure? Look, it took me quite a number of years before I came to the puppetry and found what what suited me and what was right for me. I'd enjoyed doing the other things, but nothing really clicked and took on. So it, it, I guess it's a matter of following your heart. Yeah. Um, you know what makes you feel good, um, uh, what makes you feel happy, um, and that's what you need to go for. I think it is becoming 
even harder now than it used to be. Um, everything's changing so quickly these days. It is, isn't it? Technology and so on. Um, you know, they say in 10 years' time, the jobs that people are doing today then are not going to exist, exist mm. um, uh, at all. So, um, of course, if you can find a niche, as I did with the puppetry, um, that's something that not everybody's going to be after, um, well, go for it and give it, uh, give it your all, mm. and um, hopefully uh, it'll work for you. I mean, you did take risk. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you just sort of, you, yeah. you just went, well, let's give it a bash for yeah. every kind of career you yeah. did, really. I had a wife, two children. Um, I sold the cleaning business that I had. So I didn't have a great deal of uh, cash at the time. Uh, but this came up um, so just in answer to an ad in the local paper. And uh, it worked. So that was great. That was good. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we've, got, pleasure. we've got Ralph, we've got the puppeteer, and we have Deadly all rolled into one. <laughs> <laughs> So from all of us here to all of you, thank you very much for bringing us your joy and your passion and your entertainment, whether that was from small children at creches or the small children sneaking up at night time to watch <laughs> Deadly Earnest. Any last words? I don't think I've got any last words. No? I I said all I have to say. Does Deadly have anything to say? Dudley's always got something to say. <laughs> and when he says it, he's deadly earnest.
So pretty in the sky, all so on the faces of people passing by. Be free, shaking and singing. How do you do? They really say, I, I love you. I hear babies cry and I watch them go. They'll learn much more than we'll know and I think to myself. Yeah. 